There was another, um, should I say, uh, conflict that happened in the church about the same time, and that was a debate over Paul's terms, presbyteros and episkopos. The presbyteros uh, translated as elder, and episkopos translated as as Episcopal or as as uh, the the bishop, and I noticed that uh, several authors used them synonymously, uh, including Jerome. He called Tertullian the presbyteros of of Carthage. Um, using the term elder rather than episcopos or bishop. I don't think we have to be concerned about that, and yet it it becomes uh, an issue in in the church at this time uh, that that uh, there was quite a hubbub over that that that. Uh, that was one of the reasons that those who were called presbyteros should go through a process of assuring that they were part of the apostolic succession. Because some held presbyteros in a, in a smaller manner than episcopos. That the, uh, that the bishop was assured, the one who was called Episcopos, assured that he was in apostolic succession. The one who was called Presbyteros, not too sure. And, and so it, it actually doesn't culminate until Eusebius that Eusebius goes through all of the churches east and west and, and tracks all of the churches and the records and, and looks to see who laid on hands of whom to assure that the Episcopos and the Presbyteros was indeed of apostolic succession. What happened to those who were not identified with apostolic succession? They were defrocked. They were put uh, on a term of maybe deacon. And if they were uh, allowed to work back up into that position of authority, they would still have to go through apostolic succession. Now that becomes an issue even today. In fact, you're seeing it church today amongst the Catholics and the Episcopal Church or excuse me the, the Anglican Church in England there, there's been a merger uh, to an extent should I say that the, that the Pope has, has declared that, that if anybody wants to cross over from Anglicanism as pastor to the priesthood they can do that because we recognize your apostolic succession through the Church of England. But we do not recognize Lutheran apostolic succession. Now, then there's a merger between the ELCA and the Anglican Church and the Episcopal Church saying, okay, if you're a pastor in the ELCA or if you're a bishop in the ELCA, now you have to be ordained and have the laying on of hands by an Episcopal bishop. <laughs> yes. So that you too receive apostolic succession and you can join in our, our group and you too can make the transition over if you want to, to Catholicism. Now, to, we're talking about 
something happening right now that is of incredible significance in history. We're also talking about the, the ushering in or grandfathering in of those who will walk that line their marriages. That they can actually enter into the church in Rome married and be priests. But it's interesting because there's a priest in the area that uh, was that was uh, defrocked because he married, and so he left the church, and he became an ordained Episcopal. Now, in the meantime, his his wife had passed away, but he remarried. But in the process, when he remarried, he was in the process of going back into the Catholic Church. And so this guy is uh, caught up in this, uh, and I don't remember his name. He's, uh, I think, I believe he's a local, yes he is, he's a local, uh, he's a local, uh, he's a local person, a local Episcopal priest. And he's uh, trying to, uh, to, uh, switch over again to Catholicism because he agrees with Catholicism and that's where he wants his ministry now but, but because he was prior Catholic and he, and he left and was defrocked because of marriage he can't come back so, there, so uh, you know it, it's kind of like a catch 22 Anyway, <clears throat> but the Pope has, has made that so, and that is a piece of remarkable history happening right now. Is it, is it the first of possibly the opening up of, of the priesthood? I don't know. Now, it, it certainly has every indication, although there's a, a great deal of denial in Rome. In fact, uh, they were asked of that uh, with, in regard to this recent uh, scandal. They were asked of that by, uh, the, by the, uh, a group of lay people who, who wanted response from Rome in regard to this scandal. And... Uh, and their contention was this, that celibacy has caused this problem in the church. And that, that this immorality would have been prevented many, many years ago had Jerome shut his mouth. But this issue of presbyteros and episcopos becomes relatively uh, malignant in the church. Um, and I'll use that term. It, it causes some grief. It causes some grief. It, it, it does a couple of things. It provided bishops who were on the archdiocese level to go through and disclude some who would not agree with them. I can't substantiate that. But It becomes very evident when you when you when you push the envelope out another two or three hundred years and see what is going on in Rome. That there's a precedent for everything. That in activity levels, in organizational levels, there is a precedent that is set and then it is it is built upon. You have that in the Roman emperors. You have an edict set 
and it is built upon. And the church is the same way. You have something set in motion and it is built upon. And so it's, I guess like the scripture says, there's nothing new under the sun. You see, Gnosticism, for instance, for instance has, pokes up its ugly head not just in the first, second, third centuries. And, and does it go away in the fourth century? No. It doesn't. It is in other form. It's nothing new. It's the same issue. It's the same issue again and again and again and again. Anyway, so, so in regard to the opportunity that that gave the politic of the church, it gave great politic or opportunity for that to take place. For the, for the declaration that one certain priest or one certain bishop of one place was not part of apostolic succession. In it, Rome takes some preeminent position. And I, and I want to emphasize that. And it was because of Tertullian's statement. His statement about apostolic succession and his statement about the preeminence of Rome. So you, at about 200, or maybe a little later, maybe more like 230, uh, 240, right in there, you see Rome making statements about bishops and about, about uh, dioceses and, and, uh, and about churches and, and about movements all over the realm. We're building a foundation here that will that will eventually lead to the Reformation. And and I want us I want us to concentrate on that. I want us to focus and we're looking right now at the big picture. That Rome is given the opportunity by what has been said, by what was written, to take every advantage of it. It wasn't done immediately. Callistus did not take advantage of that opportunity, but his predecessors did. I want to read something that uh, Jerome wrote about on Tertullian. Now finally, Tertullian, the presbyter, is ranked first of the Latin writers after Victor and Apollonius or Apollonius, excuse me. <clears throat> he was from the province of Africa, from the city of Carthage, where his father was, uh, and get this, and I, I, this is, I think that we must understand this about Tertullian. He was a proconsular centurion in, Car in Carthage. A proconsular Centurion. What what was that? Being proconsul, he was uh, one very wealthy. Uh, two, he had a great deal of authority within the Roman world. Now, I'll take a little caveat here. I'll, I'll I will say that. I believe that this is one reason why Tertullian was able to send letters directly to the emperor. And that in oh probably as early as maybe Commodus 
Julian makes some comments based on some of Tertullian's writings. <clears throat> but being a, a son of a proconsular centurion gave him some privilege. As, did it, as it did Paul being a citizen of Rome. But even more so for the son of a proconsular um, <clears throat> uh, centurion. A man of impetuous temperament. He was in his prime in the reign of Emperor Severus and Antonius Caracalla. And he wrote many works which I need not name since they are very widely known. At Concordia, a town in Italy, I saw an old man named Paul who s said that when he was still a very young man, he had seen in Rome a very old man who had been secretary of Blessed Cyprian and had reported to him that Cyprian was accustomed never to pass a day without reading Tertullian and would frequently say to him, hand me the master, meaning, of course, Tertullian. This one was a presbyter of the church until his middle year, but later, because of envy and reproaches of the clergy of the Roman church, he had lapsed into Montanism. And he makes mention of the new prophecy in many books. In particular, he composed against the churches of uh, the church the works on modesty, on persecution, on fasting, on monogamy, six books on ecstasy, and a seventh which he composed against Apoll Apollonius. He, he is said to have lived to a very old age and to have composed many works which are not extant. Now, it, statements like that, for instance, from Jerome, who is Bishop of, of Rome, become very powerful. For we're dealing with post-persecution Christianity, in Rome who has already taken steps toward preeminence of which Jerome uh, picked up on uh, a great deal and promotes the preeminence of, of the Roman see. And he was able to do that twofold. by taking a lesser position on Tertullian's movement toward Montanism. And by extolling his works. So it, it just so happens that, gosh, by, uh, by happenstance that... that that here's a statement from Tertullian saying that Rome has preeminence over the affairs of the church. How convenient. That bolsters the position in Rome. Now, mind you, there had already been some damage done to Rome prior to this. That when Constantine had entered into the emperorship, one of the first things he does is move the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople. And that may have been, and historians may look at that as a strategic move. That it wasn't Constantine's 
intent to to look at Rome in a different light or or in a in a negative light or to diminish its power but on the contrary many things that Eusebius and Constantine write are not necessarily in full accord with what Rome writes there are indications there are every indication that that the degradation that was taking place in Rome was actually appalling to Constantine that the moral degradation of Rome had already been a great issue it also does one other thing that if you'll notice in the future beyond Constantine that the emperor of the east becomes the, the, the lead or the emperor also of the church very similar to what happens with Henry VIII in the English Reformation and the Bishop of Rome gains preeminence in the West so much so that, that as I had mentioned earlier that by the time of Nicaea that when the Nicene Council gathers only a deacon uh, shows up from Rome and one of the issues one of the issues is Arianism the other issue is the canon and in so doing Rome is saying to the Eastern Church you've got your Greek scriptures if you would call them that and we've got our Latin scriptures now mind you at three 25 those Latin scriptures it's not the Latin Vulgate by the way it's a predecessor to that and so it is yet it is a completed text plus Apocrypha it's Old Testament New Testament and Apocrypha but at Nicaea the same is, is there I, I say that because we do have an extant and I believe to be an extant copy of the text that Constantine had commissioned by Eusebius at that time and that one of them is the Codex Sinaiticus the other is the Codex Vaticanus both early 4th century texts but they were they were they also had in them apocrypha now that doesn't bother me at all because the canon is not solidified yet these were just texts that were being used in the churches and so they were gathered they were recopied in formal form and then then sent out some 50 texts were, were commissioned that way <clears throat> what were the two texts? Sinaiticus, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus <clears throat> this issue between the Presbyteros and the Episcopos calms down at this time um, it's pretty much accepted after that that the two terms are synonymous 
Understanding, though, understanding the Greek, I would say not. And understanding the situation that was going on in Ephesus when, when uh, Paul commissions the Episcopos, I would also say not. But then that has a... Uh, that has a, uh, you know, those are all debatable items. They aren't, they're certainly not, um, they're certainly not uh, extreme, should I say, doctrinal issue. And, and remember that. Remember that, uh, that some of these issues are not necessarily something that is going to shake the church from its foundation. Another issue that arised about the same time was the, the day of Easter. When it, should be, when it should be observed. And part of that was uh, the issue of the calendar. What calendar will the church use? We're not going to go into that, uh, those debates, but it also... Uh, it also provided some conflict in the church. And that conflict was something that Rome jumped in on. And they made a decision. And most of the church fell in line because Rome made a statement. The fact that the apologists centered their, centered their focus on the heresy of the Gnostics, whether it be Marcionism, Docetism, Manichaeanism, I think is very substantial. The other issues were really not covered in the same sense that, that uh, Tertullian's treatment against Marcion was or, or that, uh, that uh, Apollonius' uh, uh, treatment against uh, Valentinus was or, or uh, Hippolytus' uh, treatment uh, toward Basilitus. These other issues that, that came up in the church were just organizational issues. And I believe the apologists took that in stride. But that's the very issues that Rome use or uses to gain some authority. And, and I find that very intriguing myself that the bishops of Rome were the ones that, that, that stepped into the fray and, and made edict. And I'll call it edict at this time. I don't think the church would have, have uh, understood it as edict. In fact, Rome pushed so much that many of the churches in the East started to push back. And this was really quite early. This was 250 to 300. Even during persecution, some of the bishops in the East were pushing back against the bishops of the West. That was due because of the language thing between Latin and Greek it was also due because the bishops of the east felt that council was the only way to resolve such issues 
that it wasn't to be resolved in a monarchical <laughs> monarchical way or in a, or a, an imperial empirical way that that the monarch bishop <laughs> was not to exercise his authority over other sees that they were in a sense what a congregational form of of government and that they would remain that way a congregational form of government that they would have self rule that they would have self organization that they would in a sense be autonomous I want to say a little bit about Montanus. Montanus arose out of Phrygia, and Phrygia is a an area that the Emperor Nero comes from. And there was a there was a movement in this region that believed this that Nero, Emperor Nero, would be raised again from the dead and he would step into the throne in Rome and rule Rome again. Now, to the Christian, that meant he could be the Antichrist. To the Roman citizens, that means that they would become preeminent again. But as a result, Montanus started to talk about the millennial kingdom and that, that the end of the world was coming. He was indeed a really a prophet in a sense in fact Jerome even calls him a prophet but what he was was he was the first millennialist in the church and he led many people that it became a very large uh, he had a very large following that one of the one of the uh, activities that he pursued was that all should sell their properties and they went out into the desert and waited for the return of the Lord. <clears throat> of course it didn't come. The parousia did not take place. Montanus was uh, about a generation prior to Tertullian and by the end of Tertullian's life he had converted to Montanism. Now, Montanus, because of that activity, um, Rome declared him to be a heretic. But they backed away from that a little bit. And, and frankly, reading the accounts I don't see that one could call him a heretic. He was just a zealous man thinking that he had discovered some prophetic path of Christ and he was going to follow it and so many people did. Very charismatic man. But he did not in any way depart from orthodoxy and I want to emphasize that he was as orthodox as any bishop 
in all of, of uh, the church. And I want to emphasize that. He did, he did hold to a, a, an austere lifestyle. He almost practiced the asceticism of Alexandria without the garbage, without the Hellenism, without the severe Gnostic tendencies. Montanus was not a Gnostic. He really is probably the, the first non-Gnostic declared heretic in the early church. Yes. He was probably declared a heretic um, because he had let, led a great deal of people into a wrong move. Um, he didn't declare to be a bishop. He was not. He didn't declare himself to be um, an episcopos or a presbyteros. He declared himself to be a prophet. But as a result of this time period, the bishops started to put rules on prophets, and those rules were laid down so that they could not spend any time in any city. They could not stay overnight in a city, for instance. They could not take any material goods out of the city. In other words, people could not give material goods to them. So the prophets became roving bands of... of uh, of uh, uh, hobos, and and I guess maybe that's the best description for them. But they but they had to operate in the strict sense of the episcopos. So, really, prophecy at the time was done away. Yes? Could it be said that it was because Christ did not return, he was a false prophet? Yes, very much so. I'm, I'm sure that because Christ did not return, he was considered to be a false prophet. And so, therefore, he had to have been a heretic. Now, if you analyze that move, especially from Rome, you see that Rome had already adopted the Old Testament form of law. That they were viewing the law in a literal sense. Remember that it was by Old Testament law that a prophet was weighed. And if everything did not come about, he would be taken out and stoned. And so the church in Rome took that opportunity as also one of authority. You see, it's another, just one more, maybe feather, in the crown of Rome. Now, mind you, I'm not painting a very pretty picture of Rome. And, and my impression is that it's hard to paint a pretty picture of Rome. Because it was... Rome was a very corrupt place. As early as Augustine, although Augustine wrote in, in 380, 390, but as early as Augustine, he recognized what was happening in Rome and its degradation. And, and I think that that is very uh, noteworthy. 
that the corruption of Rome, as Rome went at this time, after the persecutions, as Rome went, so went the church. That if Rome was corrupt, so was the church. And so it has an early start, a lot earlier than we give it. A lot earlier than we give it. We don't really view the corruption of the church in Rome until the time of the Reformation. We don't, we might tag it at about 1,000 or 1,200. But we, we don't go back to 380. We don't go back to 350. We, don't even go, we, don't, we certainly don't go back to 250. And look at the corruption in Rome and, and, and say this is the church. Our roots are not very clean. But our roots are clearly clean through Christ. That's my emphasis. Yes? Could you relate where in all of this period, which is a long period, is the Eastern Church? I mean, they are repository supposedly yes. of, the, of the, true, the true church, if you will. Yes. Uh, what, what were they... Well, you mentioned Nicaea, and they were pushing for that council. Maybe that's where it comes. Yeah, yes, uh, relating, relating what's going on in the East. The, the churches in the East felt the council was the way to, to approach a theological issue, approach um, organizational issues, uh, approach even calendar issues. And so there would be a gathering of, of bishops. And this was done early. And it's, the precedence was set at the Council of Jerusalem. The only issue that arises, though, in the Council of Jerusalem is James takes preeminence. And that becomes very uh, clear in that passage that James takes preeminence. Now, if, if apostolic succession from the, from the Jewish church is passed from Peter to Rome, then Rome would say, we have preeminence. And then they could start to look at the, the, the sayings of our Lord and pretty soon they have the keys and, and, and everything. You know, then, and they are binding and loosing and, 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 and we'll talk about that uh, when we get to that, those issues. But, uh, but in the East, they wanted to maintain the church the local church autonomy or the regional church autonomy and 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 yet they still wanted the council and the and the consensus of the bishops but after the persecution what you see in the east is you see constantine taking the the, the helm of the church so that the monarch or the emperor becomes the head of the eastern church where the bishop of Rome maintains the control in the western church and, and that at the time of Constantine the church is truly, truly split Now, I hope that kind of uh, clarifies your question. As a result, if that monarch is 
should I say, uh, more Hellenistic. He's going to be more Aryan. If he's more Judaistic, he's going to be more Orthodox, or what we've had definition of Orthodoxy. Now that that causes us to ask the question, what is Orthodoxy? Historical Orthodoxy is this, is that which Rome dictated. That is historical Orthodoxy. And I want to emphasize that. And I, and I think Pelican handles that very well early in the book. Pelican handles that, that position of orthodoxy is what? Is the winners. <laughs> not saying that Arianism was not some form of heresy. I believe it was. I believe it was too Hellenistic. But at the same time, Rome was on the opposite end of things. Rome had instituted the law again. And therefore, Marcion had a legitimate claim. Marcion had a legitimate indictment against Rome. Not against... Um, Callistus, but against uh, Hippolytus. <clears throat> Marcion and others. Uh, become a very important part of church history then. They actually form church. Remember now, the, e the East is, is going towards Hellenism and the West is going toward Judaism. And that becomes a very important part of the of the picture that that is going to be uh, that is going to should I say envelop the rest of church history. Those that issue between Hellenism and Judaism is going to going to. Initiate within the Reformation all sorts of disharmony. And, and the Reformation Church takes a very similar role as the Eastern Church not toward Hellenism, but toward church government. The Reformation Church completely uh, rejects Roman papism. Roman, the Roman Church's strong, should I say, trump cards then becomes apostolic succession. And, and their, their, should I say, spiritual lineage through Peter. And that is provable how? For at the bishop, for the episcopos, that is provable by the laying on of hands linked back to the apostles. And that could be any of the apostles, by the way. But, P 
Peter is the guy. And Peter becomes preeminent. The reason why James was no longer preeminent was because he died in Jerusalem. But Peter takes the mantle of apostolic succession into Antioch and then to the rest of the Gentiles. So Peter becomes the preeminent one in the West. Not so in the East. That any apostle was as good as any apostle. So the church in Rome actually uses this Petrin apostolic succession to claim preeminence over other bishops and even to try to defrock them if they aren't of Peter. This is a little bit later, by the way. But it, it, it's all developing fairly early again. Yes. How does the Eastern Church answer that to this Trump, this Trump card? <clears throat> um, the Eastern Church answered this Trump card by saying, okay, um, we split. We will just recognize that. We will just recognize the split on that issue. On that issue. We will, and the Eastern Church didn't have really any recourse. Even if they were to side with the West, they could not because of the Emperor of the Eastern Empire. He was the one who controlled the Church as Rome was controlled by the Bishop or by the Pope. The, the Western Church. The Eastern Church, their organization. The Eastern Church's organization became the, the basis for the organization in the Protestant churches. And, and it was either on that scale of monarch being in control of the churches. And you see that through Wycliffe's Reformation, you see that through Huss's Reformation, you see that through Luther's Reformation. Luther understood that he would either survive or die based on the princes. It's a little different in Geneva, though, in Calvin's Reformation, because they had a representative form of government. They had, a, they had a city council. And it was the city council who, was, who became the head of the Presbyterian church. But then again, that is also based on the presbyteros of the Eastern church. The understanding of the position of presbyteros. Very much so. And I believe that that influence comes through Huss. After all, Huss was in Bavaria, which was historically Eastern Church until the fall of the Byzantine Empire, in which, in which they sought help from Rome, and after about a generation of garbage, they said, enough is enough. And, and Huss said, we got to make a clean sweep here. And then the Church of Rome says, no, you don't. And they send uh, dragoons in and kill Huss. 
So thus ends the Reformation in Prague? No, because the Hussites still survived. Then in the Anglican Church, even though Henry is uh, very, very Roman and Roman Catholic, he was, uh, he was labeled the defender of the faith. He says, well, I want to divorce my wife and you're not going to let me, so I'll just make my own, I'll become Pope. And that's exactly what he did. But, again, it is an uh, Episcopal organization at the head of, of the monarch. Just like the East. But that influence, by the way, was Wycliffe. Who hit the basis of his Reformation was the basis of that organization and the power of the princes over the church. Essentially, that is, by and large, the role of organization in the first, second, and third century. It goes the way of the East or it goes the way of the West. Both highly defined. And, and that organization is going to continue even to today. So essentially, when we view Protestant organization, we view it, our, the impact is the Eastern Church, not, not the Church in Rome. That was thrown out and replaced. And it was part of the point. It was part of the Reformation. It becomes a very important part of the Reformation. <clears throat> During all that time of persecution from from way back in 70 all the way through to Nicaea or to 313 when Constantine gains control of the West and even heads toward the East. I want to emphasize that those persecutions were not general persecutions. I want to emphasize that they were all regional persecutions just with varying degrees of intensity. And depending on the depending on the zealousness of the governor or the procreator. <clears throat> the other major element uh, is is the degree of in doctrine the degree of Hellenism and the degree of Judaism how much Judaism will the church envelop or how much Hellenism will the church envelop and there's this swaying back and forth and the East goes Hellenistic the West goes Judaistic We'll stop.